17 returns from its 77th combat mission over Germany and the occupied countries to be given an honorable discharge as a war-weary airplane. But fate and the 8th Air Force decree that hers shall be an end more befitting such a gallant queen of battles. With others like her, she is destined to be fitted out with special equipment loaded to the gills with 20,000 pounds of high explosives and sent on one last trip with a one-way ticket. Remotely controlled by high-frequency radio from an accompanying ship called the Mother, this explosive-laden B-17 will be dubbed a baby and will fly her last mission solo. On the day of her last mission, two pilots will board her, take off and climb to a designated altitude, set up the C-1 automatic pilot, check her special equipment with the accompanying mother ship, arm her load of explosives, and then bail out while still over England. From then on, without a soul aboard, she'll fly her last flight plan as a remotely controlled flying bomb and will crash into the target as the largest single mass of explosives ever launched by man against an enemy. The first step in the conversion of the war-weary airplane into a remotely controlled robo-aircraft is the complete stripping of the baby ship. All the turrets are removed, and all turret openings are sealed, thus streamlining and greatly adding to the speed and carrying power of the plane. First, all armament, navigational equipment, and bombing equipment is removed from the nose section. In the pilot's compartment, the removal of the turret and all oxygen equipment allows space for the carrying part of the heavy explosive load. The co-pilot's seat is removed and replaced by the bombardier's stool to allow more room and facilitate bailout procedure. The bomb bay doors are closed and sealed shut, and all door operating equipment is removed. Since the Tokyo tanks have been removed, the tank valves located in the bomb bay are also taken out. The radio compartment is stripped clean of all equipment, such as the command transmitter receiver, the liaison transmitter receiver, and other miscellaneous items. In the waist section, armor plate, guns, and other equipment is removed. In the tail, the guns and ammunition boxes are removed and the opening sealed. With all the unnecessary equipment stripped out, the baby now weighs about 32,000 pounds. The nose escape hatch is modified by removing the door, enlarging the hatch opening, and adding a wind deflector screen. The inside of the enlarged hatch is fared smooth with sheet aluminum. These modifications are to facilitate bailout of the baby ship crew who must leave by this exit. After the baby is completely stripped, the following equipment is added to make it a controllable flying rowboat. In the nose section on the vacant navigator's table, the control receiver selector is installed. This receiver takes the impulse from the mother and sends them through the proper channels for the remote operation of the baby. Two trim motors are added, together with special potentiometers. Speed the remote signal from the mother into the C-1 automatic pilot, causing the ship to climb, dive, or turn as the controller desires. The bank of relays in the foreground are added to route the electrical impulses from the receiver selector unit to the proper equipment to obtain the control desired by the control pilot in the mother aircraft. Under the navigator's table is mounted the radio altimeter, commonly dubbed the ACE. This is used to maintain the baby at a prearranged altitude above the terrain. The potentiometer, located at the end of the arm of the left-hand trim motor, 
is a necessary part of this equipment. Tying all these together with the necessary cables and wiring, you see the equipment that is necessary for the remote operation of the baby. Mounted on the circular piece of plywood which covers the space previously occupied by the chin turret is the television conversion unit commonly known as the camera. This submits back to the control pilot and the mother a picture of what is directly in front of the baby. It serves as his eye when going in on the target run. On top of the television camera case is a repeat back compass. This instrument makes it possible to transmit a picture of the magnetic compass in the baby so as to provide the controlled pilot a means of determining the baby's magnetic heading. Mounted on the right-hand side of the nose compartment is the magnetic compass, which provides the picture for the television camera. The wiring is next added, which completes the installation. The instrument panel contains six important items in addition to the regular engine and flight instruments. The crew must check these six carefully before bailing out. Number one is the radio altimeter on-off switch, which must be turned to the on position. Number two is the radio altimeter range switch, which must be on the high range position. Number three, the altitude selector switch, must be set to the predetermined altitude. Immediately to the left are three lights which indicate whether the radio altimeter is working satisfactorily. Number four is an amber light, which when on, indicates to the pilot that the radio altimeter is connected to the C-1 pilot and will hold the aircraft at a constant altitude above the terrain. Number five is the television filament switch which keeps the camera and transmitter ready for instant use. Number six is known as the centering switch and will center the pitch and roll trim motors mounted on the navigator's table. This is necessary to synchronize the remote control switches prior to turning the baby over to the control pilot for radio control. This is the C1 automatic pilot control panel by which the pilot sets up the aircraft prior to bailing out. The automatic pilot is standard B-17 equipment and is not modified in any way. After setting the C-1 pilot up for flight, the human pilot turns the transfer switch to the number two or bombardier's position. This allows the autopilot to receive signals from the mother. Mounted above the throttle quadrant and attached to the throttles by linkage, is the throttle motor installation by which the throttle position may be varied remotely. Looking forward from the waist, on the right is the standard liaison transmitter, which is used as a homing device for the radio compass in the control plane. It is possible for the control pilot to turn it on or off at will. On the left in the background, as an additional means of locating the baby in case it is lost, is the standard Eureka responder. Also shown is a standard VHF transmitter receiver used for interplane communication while setting up the baby for remote control. Looking to the rear in the waist section, immediately forward of the tail wheel well is the television transmitter together with its power supply. On the outside are added the whip antenna on the nose, which is the receiving antenna for the control receiver selector, through which all control signals are received. On the tail is the television transmitting antenna. Beneath the plane are the two antennas for the radio altimeter. The location of these is critical to prevent interference from the plane itself. Also on the outside is mounted the 75 gallon smoke tank used as a visual aid to find and guide the baby. It is mounted on a bomb shackle bolted through the bomb bay doors to the catwalk support. This tank, when filled with FS smoke, weighs over 1,200 pounds. Smoke is dispensed through the electrical solenoid valves.
The control plane is a standard B-17G with full armament. It carries no bomb load. Its crew consists of pilot, co-pilot, two navigators, the controller or stick pilot, the radio operator, and four gunners. Mounted immediately in front of the controller set in the mothership is the control box, where all control signals originate. From the control box, the impulses are conducted to the transmitter modulator unit located on the right side of the radio room. Also mounted in the radio room is an amplifier, which is used to increase the power output of the transmitter when enemy jamming is encountered. The transmitting antenna is installed on the roof of the radio room. As a means of determining the presence of enemy jamming, a control monitor receiver, identical to the one on the baby, is installed in the radio room. The output is connected to three banks of lights, which, when lit, indicate the presence of a control impulse on the air. One set of lights is provided for the radio operator, another set for the co-pilot, and a third set in the controller's position. Also to the right in the radio room is the television receiver and screen which picks up the picture transmitted from the baby ship. In order to obtain maximum reception, a beamed or directed television antenna is provided. The switches located immediately below the transmitter receiver control the servo motor of the antenna. The motors are housed in this box, which is located immediately in front of the tail wheel. The antenna can be turned to the left or right through 360 degrees and can be centered to a predetermined position. Mounted directly in front of the controller's seat in the nose is the television monitor with viewer which the controller uses for the final stages of the target run. Mounted on the navigator's table immediately forward to the G-box is the Rebecca transponder by which the mother ship is able to determine the exact distance between the mother and the baby. It having been decided that the weather for the next day would be suitable for a mission, the loading of the baby is started as early as possible. Experience has shown that it requires approximately seven hours to load each ship. The best explosive for the purpose desired, after trying several types and detonating static loads of each, was determined to be the British Torpex, cast in 55-pound blocks. The first step is stringing of the primacord from the nose to the tail of the baby. In the pilot's compartment occupying the space made available by the removal of the upper turret is placed 25 boxes of Torpex totaling 1,575 pounds. After the boxes have been installed, they are anchored securely to the structural members of the aircraft by means of cables. The bomb bay is next loaded with 210 boxes, totaling 13,230 pounds. In order to ensure high order detonation, the booster charge is connected to the main prime accord line which was previously strung throughout the ship. The load is secured as that in the pilot's compartment by means of turnbuckles and cables.
The third and final charge is loaded into the radio room. 100 boxes, totaling 6,300 pounds, are used. As in the other two cases, turnbuckles and cables attached to structural members of the aircraft are used to hold the load rigidly. Five fuses are mounted in a specially constructed box, which is bolted to the floor just forward of the nose compartment bulkhead. The main primer cord lines strung throughout the aircraft are connected to this fuse box. The nose compartment fuse box is armed by the crew member just prior to bailout by pulling the ring seen in the center of the picture. The fuses in the radio room are armed by pulling this cable, which runs through a system of pulleys to the fuses in that compartment. To prevent secret equipment from falling into the hands of the enemy, complete destruction of the television transmitter is assured by wrapping it several times with prima cord. The prima cord is then spliced to the main line strung through the ship. The final step is completed as the prima cord is woven through the various arms of the television antenna. This project flies its missions virtually as a separate task force. The component parts of the task force are assembled at the project base to facilitate briefing and the close coordination of the various component parts of the task force, the fighter support and the Mosquito and P-38 photographic ships are landed at the project base before briefing. The usual size of the striking force has been limited to two baby ships due to the limited spread of the radio frequencies assigned to this project for control and television. The rest of the task force consists usually of four photographic reconnaissance ships, a varied number of fighter planes for protection depending on the location of the target, two mother ships per baby, the second being a safety factor in case of damage to the equipment, and two observation ships to observe the point where the baby pilots land after bailing out of the baby. It is advisable to also include one PFF ship in case doubtful weather makes additional navigation facilities desirable. The target for the day is usually chosen at the project headquarters depending on the area of the best weather from among several previously assigned by the 8th Air Force. Since the weapon depends for its effect upon blast alone, the best results can be obtained on targets in heavily built up areas. The target time and approach are planned to afford the best light conditions possible for the television equipment. The baby pilots who are to make a parachute jump wear carefully fitted back tight parachutes with a 28 foot canopy and have auxiliary detachable chest tight chutes with a 24 foot canopy. After a careful and thorough ground check of all equipment prior to taxiing, the strike force and accompanying ships take off for the mission. The baby crew climb to altitude, trim the aircraft for cruising speed, and very carefully set up the C-1 automatic pilot. In order to facilitate visual observation of the baby under adverse weather conditions, the upper surface of the wings and the vertical stabilizer are painted bright yellow. Once assured that the automatic pilot is operating satisfactorily, the baby pilot turns the transfer control, which places the baby under the remote control of the mother. All controls are checked for positive operations while the crew are still in the baby. The controller in his check gives the baby a right turn by moving the metal stick to the right. This generates an electrical impulse in the transmitter modulator unit, which broadcasts a particular audio tone. The radio wave from the control plane is picked up by the receiver selector unit in the baby aircraft. There, the audio tone is filtered out and causes certain relays to be operated. 
The operation of these relays supplies electrical power to the trim motors. The trim motor rotates the potentiometers, which is the turn control of the C-1 pilot. As the potentiometer moves, the baby aircraft responds by turning to the right. Response to the controller's impulse is instantaneous. To return the wings to level flight, the controller places the stick box on the automatic position by simply depressing the switch on the upper left corner of the control box. This causes a radio signal to be broadcast and received by the baby, which returns the trim motor to a predetermined position. As the motor moves, the signal is fed into the C-1 pilot, and the baby assumes level flight. As the pilot gives the down or dive control, the impulse is transmitted by the mother. The baby receives a signal which causes the trim motor governing the pitch attitude of the baby to rotate. Rotation of the motor feeds a signal into the C-1 pilot, resulting in the baby going into a dive. By simply moving the stick, the controller can turn and dive or climb as he desires. Switches incorporated in the trim motor are adjusted to limit the angle of bank to approximately 15 degrees. The length of time that the control impulse is transmitted determines the degree of bank and climb or dive of the baby. With a little practice, the control pilot soon becomes adept at making minute corrections in the attitude of the baby. In the upper left corner is located the stepper switch. The row of lights along the top of the box indicate the position of the switch. Pulling to the rear on the switch returns it to the automatic position. The baby now is held on a constant heading by the C-1 pilot and cannot be turned either right or left. However, it may be caused to dive or climb. The switch in the lower left corner controls the throttles on the automatic position. When pushed forward, the throttle motor in the baby advances the throttle levers. When the switch is pulled towards the controller, the throttles are retarded. When the stepper switch is pressed forward, the flashing light indicates that it has advanced or stepped one position. When this light is lit, the baby may be turned right or left, climbed or dived, and the throttles advanced or retarded. On the succeeding step, the switch in the lower left corner either turns on or off the liaison transmitter in the baby. As a safety precaution, the little button immediately to the left of the stick must be depressed to permit stepping beyond the number three position accidentally. When in the number four position, it is possible to turn on and off the radio altimeter in the baby. Number five position controls the smoke and may be turned on or off at will. Number six position gives control over the television transmitter in the baby. When it has been definitely established that the baby responds to all the controls of the mother, the baby pilots prepare to bail out. The last thing which must be accomplished prior to leaving the aircraft is arming the load, which the baby pilot does by pulling the cables located near the exit. The co-pilot and pilot follow each other out in quick succession over a pre-designated area where the military personnel in the vicinity have been alerted to lend whatever assistance is necessary. The baby is turned to proper heading and crosses the English coast on the way out. Further along the course, bad visibility and clouds are encountered, and the controller loses sight of the baby. He steps the control box up to number three position and turns on the liaison radio on the baby. He then tunes in on his radio compass and gets a bearing on the lost ship. He turns it to right thus getting the baby directly ahead. Knowing its bearing, but unable to see it, 
he steps on up to number five and turns on the smoke. Having located the baby visually, he is able to guide it over the enemy coast and on into the target area. At the initial point, which is normally 35 miles from the target, the throttles are retarded and the baby allowed to descend to ace altitude. Smoke is then used as a means of aiming the baby until the target becomes visible in the television screen. By means of this picture and without aid of ACE, the controller is able to fly the baby directly into the target.